So here we are at the end. Dot Hack Quarantine is the fourth and final volume within the IMOQ series, and what a volume it was. Quarantine specifically is stuffed with so much storyline and content in comparison to the previous entries that you would have expected it to be split into two games rather than one final chapter. That being said, more does not always mean better. This latest entry within IMOQ is plagued with long, grueling dungeons and difficult content that may leave you scratching your head and questioning why you're even trying trying to complete it. For many of us, it's due to passion. Just like this history series, Dot Hack is a series that is created out of enjoyment for the material. Regardless of the state of gameplay, Dot Hack still manages to finish off its storyline with a bang, leading into a finale that is both well earned as well as an epilogue that provides the player with one of the worst dungeons in the game. And just like the other volumes, Liminality also sees its finale as well. The conclusion of Tokuoka, Mai, Yuki, and Kyoko's storylines and their relevance to both the overarching narrative of the Dot .hack universe, as well as Tokuoka's work in saving Kaiden in his final battle will all be explored and explained, and this particular entry is interesting as you can really see the connections between what is happening in the real world versus the world MMO. If you haven't watched my previous videos on the history of infection, mutation, and outbreak, I suggest you do so now. Additionally, if you enjoy these videos, videos and want to help support the channel, please consider liking the video and subscribing. It just takes a couple of seconds and really helps boost the reach of the video to Dot .hack fans everywhere. What is Dot .hack and how did it become one of the most expansive media series out there today, with multiple video games, animes, manga, light novels, OVAs, and so on? I'm Super Rad, and I'm here to bring you a brief history of Dot .hack Quarantine. As always, we'll start with the storyline of the series. As a quick recap, the character we play as, Kite, began his adventures within the MMO The World after being invited by his friend Orca. Orca and Kite were both attacked by a viral data object known as Scathe, and Orca was placed into a coma after being data drained. Kite received a bracelet from Aura that allowed him to do the same thing, but against the monsters and viral creatures within the game. Data draining and its secondary ability, gate hacking, allow Kite to travel to locked off areas within the game as well as destroy members of the cursed waves such as Scathe, Innis, Magus, and many others. Kite meets up with various other members, including Black Rose, whose brother was also placed into a coma due to the events within the world. Kite teams up with the notorious hacker Helba and many other individuals within the world, including the system admins, to begin fighting against whatever lies within the world in order to save both his friends and the AI child Aura. The group untangle various mysteries on their adventures, including the motivations of the creator of the world, Harold Howerwick, and the AI creation system, Morgana Mode Gone whose job it was to create the ultimate AI before attempting to prevent it after gaining sentience, but we'll get into that a little bit later within Liminality. As Kite and his party begin defeating the eight members of the Cursed Wave, various aspects of the world begin to fall apart. Kite and his party also ran into an enigmatic monster known as Cubia that chases after Aura, leading to confrontations whenever she finds and talks to Kite. By the end of the third game, Cubia is still out there, but Kite and his party are ready to counterattack the cursed wave in order to save the world. Everything from here on will detail the story within Quarantine. As I just mentioned, Kite and his group formed a counterattack against the cursed wave. Kite specifically felt he better understood Harold's game that had been laid out for them, and how they were supposed to play it in order to defeat the remaining phases of the cursed wave, including Maha, Tarvos, 
and Korbanek. That's right, within one game of the quadrilogy, you are tasked with facing off against four phases in total, and if you watched the previous entries, you'd understand how taxing that can be on top of virus core hunting and various other mechanics within the game. After their meeting, Kite gets an email to meet up with Leos in the new Omega server, which you get to travel to only for it to quickly go offline. Helba manages to salvage the server by replacing it with her own, thus turning the Omega server city into a net slum aesthetic. Later on, Kite runs into Elk, who is looking for Mia as she has apparently gone missing and he's starting to lose his marbles, you know, j just a little bit just a little bit, which is a running theme for the character in the series that follows this one. If you watched my previous videos, you know that Mia has been acting a, a little weird for some time now, and we'll see the conclusion of her story arc shortly. Part of the team's plan is to deal with the wave of data by hitting it with a vaccine program created by Helba. Oddly enough, you never really see the vaccine physically or even its use. All of the phases are technically defeated by Kite. But there seems to be suggestions that Helba and the team with the vaccine are at least doing something, you know, in the background, but you, you never see it. The plan is to trap the phases by having system administration slowly track them. Kite references a similar setup to what orca whales do, trapping prey with a single exit of escape to herd them towards a dead end. He aptly names the next operation, Operation Orca. Meanwhile, the real world is experiencing its own host of issues via the network crisis created by Morgana and her cursed wave. The hospital that is housing Orca's comatose body, aka Yasuhiko, has a new bulletin explaining various issues with their machines. This prompts Kite and Black Rose into accelerating their plans and motivates them further. Before continuing, however, Kite is given a keyword by one of the Netslum NPCs, and this takes him and Black Rose to another dungeon with a herald room that reads off the epitaph. Elk agrees to join the team, but this will cause a few issues later due to his depressive spiral involving Mia. Pyros also calls on Kite for some help dealing with a scammer, but it's just a filler quest and turns out Pyros misunderstood, putting him in the wrong. Now, as the operation is put into place, Kite and his team travel to keyword cruel vindictive stars, and they'll actually have to come here three separate times, meaning you, the player, will have to explore this same dungeon three times as well. Unfortunately for Kite and the party, when they reach the end of the dungeon, it seems that the wave has dissipated and a new data spike has appeared elsewhere, prompting Kite and his party to chase after it. This leads them to Mia, who cries out in agony over her personality and identity being erased while transforming her into one of the cursed wave phases, Maha. Kite and his party defeat Maha in one of the longest cursed wave fights yet, and Maha turns back into Mia temporarily for Elk and Kite to see her as she dies. Elk loses his mind and blames Kite for what happened while Mia dissipates in Kite's arms. There's no real time to grieve, however, as Leos informs Kite that the wave has reappeared within Cruel Vindictive Scars. The party heads back for a second time out of three times and runs into Aura, which, if you have been keeping up, means that they also run into Kubia. This leads into another battle encounter where the party must defeat three of Kubia's cores one after another. These fights in particular are rather grading due to the core having either magic or physical tolerance and switching between them periodically. Once Kubia retreats, the party heads back to the Omega server root town and every party member shows up to help with the final operations, including any optional party members you picked up throughout your journey within the quadrilogy. The party heads to Cruel Vindictive Stars for the third and final time, this time running into the phase known as Tarvos. Once defeated, Kite meets up with various Netslum NPCs within Omega server who all disappear. Later on, they all post on the BBS providing keywords that will allow Kite to gain the virus cores necessary to visit Herald within the world. Each of these areas are incredibly important in terms of leveling up your party due to them housing a specific enemy known as Guardians. Guardians are creatures created by Morgana to exert her will where the phases typically cannot. For example, within the anime.hack sign, Tsukasa has a Guardian present with them that frequently defends them for reasons explained within the anime. Each Guardian appears gelatinous with a twilight a bracelet within its core. The bracelet allows them to perform data drain within the anime, but I never saw this in the game itself. Once data drained, a guardian takes on the form of the bracelet itself. While being incredibly powerful, it's still relatively easy to defeat and can offer upwards of 520 experience per kill, making it a huge bonus to run into as you'll gain late game levels incredibly quickly. Once all four areas are cleared and the data bugs within them have been defeated, Kite will have four virus cores necessary to enter 
capture one of the worst dungeons in the game. This is a 10 level dungeon full of data bugs, meaning that the player will be data draining a lot unless they get exceptionally lucky. Since data draining causes Kite's virus level to rise and getting it too high can lead to a game over, the player essentially has to make sure that they get the last hit in on any enemies to help lower their level. It is exceptionally grueling and it's only trumped by the even worse bonus dungeon at the end of the game. At the end of the dungeon, Kite and Black Rose come face to face with a program that looks like a rock. Some sort of, you know, some it's a rock. Containing the personality of Harold, although it seems somewhat corrupted. When Kite and Black Rose ask Harold how to stop what is happening, he explains that what is in motion cannot be undone. There will be either death or rebirth, and the group simply needs to see it through. That being said, he does inform Kite that things are always darkest before the dawn. Aura appears and, you guessed it, so does Kubia, who ultimately shatters the Herald software program and wipes him from existence. Aura explains to Kite that he cannot fight Kubia, as Kubia is essentially a shadow cast by the existence of his bracelet. For Kubia to exist, the bracelet must exist, and vice versa. This leads into another triple core battle followed by a two-phase Kubia fight. At the end, Kite realizes the only way to defeat Kubia is to destroy his bracelet, so him and Black Rose do just that, ending Kubia's reign of terror once and for all. Kite believes that even without the bracelet, now that they have aura, they will be able to find a way to defeat the final phase, Korvenek. Kite theorizes with his party that the epitaph of the Twilight could mean either dusk or dawn, either death or rebirth, and he believes that Harold believed in daybreak due to mentioning things are darkest before the dawn. He believes Harold knew what would come of them fighting the phases and Kubia, and therefore believes that they have the means to defeat Korbanek despite the bracelet being lost. This leads into the final confrontation in the game against Korbanek, the final phase of the Cursed Wave. The player has to fight through three rounds of the creature as it transforms over time from a seed to a leaf and then eventually a, a creepy set of eyes. During the second phase of the fight, Korbanek puts up a shield that can't be broken through, but Aura shows up with the personas of all the coma victims, including Orca, Black Rose's brother, and Sieg, who is the boyfriend of Mai from Liminality. These personas are able to weaken the shield protecting Korbanek and allow Kite and his party to deal the final blow, leading into the last phase of the battle. The server also begins to crash during this, but much to the surprise of Helba, it comes back online. This is important important later as it leads to a bit of an inaccuracy when connecting liminality to the game. Sieg specifically says something along the lines of Orca of the Azure Sea and Balmung of the Azure Sky, I won't lose to you. And this is also a semi-important phrase to be brought up again later within liminality. Once near the end of the fight, Korbanek uses a special form of data drain known as Drain Heart, which manages to hit everyone except Kite as he is saved by Elk who takes the attack instead. He apologizes to Kite for being so awful before disappearing. Kite uses this as an opening to pursue Korbanek and try to land a killing blow. However, right before he can, Aura steps in front of him and takes the blow instead. This seems to cause her data to explode and act as the killing blow towards Korbanek. While Kite initially believes this to mean Aura has died, this is not actually the case and she has simply been reborn through the process as a full AI. With all the phases taken care of, everyone reunited with their party members as well as the coma victims who have all begun to wake up in the hospital. Later on, Kite logs in to talk to his friends while he and Orca head to the same first dungeon from the first volume in the series where Orca was initially attacked. This gives him an eerie feeling of deja vu, but they press on and meet with Aura who bestows Kite with another bracelet so it can be used within the endgame content of Quarantine. Kite's battle was witnessed by some other players within the world, and the BBS begins to refer to him and his friends as the Dot Hackers. Aura sends an email to Kite informing him that another birth is about to take place within the world, but something is trying to prevent it. This leads El and Kite into a whopping 15 level dungeon. Easily the worst and most grueling dungeon in the game as it is full of data bugs and you essentially have to be lucky in terms of data draining, praying your virus level doesn't rise too high as you advance. As Elk and Kite progress through the dungeon, they see Phase Maha, a cat-like version of Maha that appeared in the Dot Hack Sign series. Maha originally worked for Morgana, but betrayed her after Sukasa, the sign protagonist, showed her kindness. Maha sacrificed herself in that series, but with the death of Maha in the games, seems to have been reborn. At the end of the dungeon, Kite and Elk have to fight the Dawn Wanderer, which upgrades into the Temptress Lover midway through the fight in order to save Maha. 
When they do, Maha transforms and turns back into Mia. While this is good news and Mia remembers Elk allowing them to be reunited, she seems to have lost all of her memories from before infection. Recreating the scene from her first meeting with Kite where she talks about his bracelet and asks whether or not he can see it. Despite her memories being gone, Kite and Elk are simply happy to see that she's back, allowing the game to further end on a very positive note. That being said, what happens to Mia down the line, leading up to dot hack GU is pretty depressing, and Elk doesn't come out of it unscathed at all. That's for another video series, however, and the story of dot hack IMOQ technically ends here. But we're not done just yet, now it's time to go over the events of the final episode of Liminality. Dot Hack Liminality Volume 4 Trismegistus is the final entry within the Liminality series, seeing Tokuoka, Mai, Yuki, and Kyoko all united for a raid on a high security data building where they hope to find evidence to take CC Corp to court. I'm not sure why the title of the OVA is what it is. Hermes Trismegistus is a Greek name for an Egyptian god surrounding mysticism and magic. I can only assume it has to do with the magical nature surrounding their job in the world. Tokuoka and the girls are on a small cruise ship eating sushi, implied to have all been paid for by Helda's group of hackers. They're on their way to meet with Ichiro Sato or Bith the Black from the previous volume and are infiltrating a mega float so that they can access the Maritime Information and Support Center, which has countless high power computers for them to access and make use of while trying to gain evidence on CC Corp. Ichiro meets up with the group and they take a smaller watercraft to the shore as it has less security than if they took the roads. The group discusses how data volumes within the game seem to be abnormally large and they often shrink back to normal size after some time. Time. This discussion leads into Harold's motivations for the world and how he loved Emma so much that he looked to create their child as an AI within the game. Fragment, the prototype for the world, was merely a container for said child, that being Aura, and the fluctuating data volumes actually housed the personas of individuals playing the MMO. By collecting their personality data and feeding it to Aura through the Morgana system, they could create the ultimate AI with a personality of their own. This system inadvertently created its own personality and thus became Morgana Mode Gone, since Morgana understood that her sole purpose was to birth Aura and therefore would be destroyed after the fact, Morgana did everything within its power to stop this from happening, including creating the Cursed Wave and creating the Network Crisis. The malice of the world is causing said Network Crisis and thus they can't have Helba help them directly currently, so it's up to the group to sneak in. The group manages to get into the main building and bypass the security system, although this does lead to a routine check. However, the security team doesn't see anything while investigating and begin heading on their way only to see that a vending machine was accessed 5 minutes ago by Yuki when Tokuoka asked her to get him a coffee. This leads Ichiro, Yuki, and Kyoko to distract security for as much time as possible while Tokuoka works on the server and Mai accesses the world through Seek's account. While accessing, she sees a message pop up from Seek expressing how he won't lose to Orca and Bao Meng. This is the same line we see Sieg say in the game. Say that really f- See Sieg say. See Sieg say. Alright. Tokuoka manages to get the processes set up for his server, but is unable to link it with Helba's. This is because the events of Liminality are happening side by side with the Corbinic fight and leads to instability. Instead of linking with her server, he deems it necessary to replace hers with his own. During this point, we see Tominari, aka Sieg, in the hospital beginning to awaken from his coma. Mai begins to get motion sick and has to be temporarily saved from the game by Tokuoka, but she goes back in shortly after to help replace the server. Meanwhile, Yuki and Kyoko are being chased by security. Mai mentions how she saw everyone in the game fighting to save the world and the coma victims. Now this is where a bit of inaccuracies between the games and OVA begin. In the games we see the problems on Helba's side because we see the server begin to crash during the Corbinic fight. They suddenly come back online and Helba is confused as to how this is the case. However, in the anime, Ichiro shows back up to Mai and Tokuoka's location, where Tokuoka informs him that they will replace Helba's server. Liminality implies that Helba knew about the plan all along, yet the games imply that she had no idea what happened. This could simply be a slip up between two teams trying to create parallels within the story. However, there is a theory that Helba is actually multiple people. It's 
possible the Helba Ichiro was talking to was not the Helba we interact with within the games. Regardless, Tokuoka and Mai managed to successfully swap the servers, allowing the characters within the game to continue their fight with Korbanek. Tokuoka and Mai abscond from the scene while Ichiro stays behind to meet with security. When they arrive, Ichiro explains that he is a network security analyst that works for the company and flashes a business card before walking off with the men that had come to take him in. He seemingly gets out of this situation scot-free. Tokuoka is not so lucky, however. As Yuki and Kyoko are cornered by security, they are saved by Tokuoka and Mai who knock out the men from behind. However, one wakes up and grabs Tokuoka and he tells the girls to run while there's still time. They do so and Tokuoka gets beaten for a short time before being thrown into some sort of jail by the security team. It's, it's not a police jail but you can tell it's some sort of like security area. Now I had to look this up on the wiki as I was unsure where he ended up and how he got out, but Tokuoka does walk out of the jail after being beaten. The wiki states that this is because Helba expunged his records or something, but I could never find actual proof of this. Rather, I think the simpler answer would be that Ichiro convinced them to let him out since they were part of the network security analysts. Once out, he's met with the three girls who came to greet him and they mention how it's a shame they lost all the data they could have used against CFC Corp to bring them to court. However, Tokuoka pulls out a small data disk from his back pocket, implying he had the information they needed. The girls celebrate and Tokuoka suggests that they all go grab a bite to eat, ending the episode. Liminality is a rather special piece of media. I don't think I've ever seen a game series that actually provided an anime episode with each release like what .hack has done here. It's one of the most unique ways of presenting media to a player and effectively acted as a bonus to look forward to whenever you bought a new volume. While the overarching story of Liminality wasn't the deepest form of storytelling we've ever seen, the sheer aesthetic and vibe given off within each episode was fantastic to watch even today. The art style, music, and locations all lend themselves to make Liminality as great as it is. Most importantly, Liminality offered us a glimpse into the real world outside the MMO so we could see the effects the games we're having on Japan rather than just the various areas within the world. Liminality is a philosophical and anthropological concept. It discusses one's sense of self and identity and the transitional process we may go through or our society may go through during a catastrophic event. In a way, Kite's party and Tokuoka's team are dealing with liminality. Yuki specifically mentions how the old her has died, and she is excited to be the new version of herself. In the same way, everyone in the series has grown and transitioned in some way, shedding their past selves and becoming someone new entirely, seeing the birth of something new, similar to Aura being born as the ultimate AI. Now I'd like to move on from the real world of liminality and head back over to the MMO so we can discuss the various new and repeating gameplay features seen in Quarantine. So in terms of gameplay additions, there isn't much that is new. Rather, we have a lot of repeating concepts we have seen in previous entries. Obviously, the first of the major additions is the new root town on Omega server. However, as I mentioned in the story section, Kite is only here for a moment before it goes offline and is replaced with a net slum town. The net slum town can be accessed by any player as it acts as a replacement root town. It's incredibly small in comparison to all other towns, making it much easier to navigate to the various shops. Interesting. Sigma Server, a town you visit after it's already been corrupted, can be visited after beating the game to see it in its original glory, along with its own town theme playing. This is the only time you see it this way. On the other side, the Omega Server root town is never replaced with its original version, meaning you never get to explore it unfortunately. In terms of generic gameplay, this is the volume where players can finally hit level 99. One of the best ways to get close to this is by grinding guardians, which I mentioned earlier due to them giving some of the highest EXP in the game. Some of the most annoying enemies will be found within this entry, however. Things that can essentially one-shot you, cast constant debuffs on you, or be tolerant to certain types of attacks all come in droves, meaning you have to be alert at all times while fighting, otherwise you could get overwhelmed in the blink of an eye. Items are incredibly necessary, and that means a lot of trips to shop, so having a lot of GP on you is essential. On top of annoying enemies, there are plenty of data bug areas within 
within this volume, meaning not only do you have to fight a monster, but then data drain it to fight it again and then finally kill it. Other than that, combat remains the same. You perform your basic attacks and spam skills or spells when necessary, and you tell your party to generally do the same unless you need one to be a designated healer. Speaking of data draining, this game requires the player to collect J, K, and L cores from small, medium, and large monsters respectively. It is highly recommended that you follow a guide or something through the previous volumes to make sure you always have enough cores going into the next volume. As receiving cores from previous volumes gets exponentially harder as you level up and progress throughout the game. Kite also receives a final data drain ability known as Drain Heart, which we see Corbinek use in the final fight of the game. It acts similarly to 2128 Drain in that it gives you a better chance at receiving rare items. But this one is an AoE version, and you'll probably never use it. In fact, you rarely even use 2128 Drain outside of trying to get some rare equipment for endgame bosses in each volume. There are no new party members for you to unlock throughout the initial playthrough of Quarantine, however post-game will net you a few, specifically Helba, who will be level 99 with maximum HP and MP, making her one of if not the best wave masters in the game. That's hackers for you. Additionally, you will obtain the member addresses for Sukasa, Subaru, and Sora. Now, there's been a lot of explanations on how to unlock them in the game, all the, all the way back to 2006. However, from my understanding, you will unlock Tsukasa and Subaru regardless of if you viewed all of the sign memory events and ghost characters interactions within Mutation. However, I believe you only receive Sora if you freed him from Skaith's wand in Mutation, but this might be wrong too. I also saw somebody online on a forum claim that they're AI, but I've never seen proof of this. I don't even know why they would be AI technically, because you do save Sora. It, it could be the real him technically. Even if it's not canon, it could be him. To find out how the characters are unlocked, one would need to play through IMOQ from start to finish and guarantee that they skip all of the events to see what unlocks them, and I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to do that ever again. Ever. Players also unlock Orca as a party member at the end of the game, and can save Mia through the endgame bonus dungeon, making her available again as well. For side quests, Moonstone will invite you to a high level area that is good for grinding. This is really an excuse however, as he wants to obtain an item from the area's god statue to give to a girl so he can get her member address. Rachel also gets a new dungeon and a player rescue service, where she and a party will go down into a dungeon to help out players that may find themselves stuck. This somewhat backfires as she gets treated as a delivery service to bring an item to another player, but in the end she accepts this as she was able to help someone out. Marlo gets a very useful dungeon where he drags Kite along to an area that has a large chest room at the end of the dungeon. There's about 11 chests in the room and many of them contain stat raising items. It's a way of Marlo showing his appreciation to Kite. A BBS post talks about Subaru and the Crimson Knights. One member asks Subaru to visit him with his specific keyword. Going to said area and grabbing the God statue starts a cutscene where the players meet Krim from Dot Hack Sign. He doesn't join the party, but he does give them his spear. If the player gets Black Rose and Terajima both to 1000 affection, the maximum either can be. They will both send Kite an email to find a rare item in a dungeon. Both provide the same keyword and Kite has to take each of them along at the same time. The dungeon is full of forks in the road, causing Black Rose and Terajima to fight with one another over which way to go constantly. By choosing Terajima's route at least twice, Kite can obtain Subaru's axe. I found this one incredibly silly, considering fairy orbs exist within the game and show the player the map of the area, as well as where all the monster portals would be. They, sh they shouldn't have been arguing over this, because it's a clear game mechanic that they would know where to go. The Golden Goblins are back and consist of five tag events for the player to take part in. I'm not going to go over the mechanics of the goblin fights again but it's worth noting that you can bring your party along this time, making it substantially easier. This volume also marks your final set of Grunties to obtain. Players can get the obvious Noble Grunty that appears in every server, as well as the Rocker Grunty and the Woody Grunty. Once all three are obtained, another flag race is unlocked for Omega Server. Should the player complete this and get first place, as well as first place in all other servers, they get a bonus wallpaper. Early into quarantine, there is an item completion event that is mentioned, but ultimately cancelled. Players are expected 
expected to obtain and show off around 600 items in order to receive a prize. The event may be cancelled, but is brought back within the post game and can be completed. However, it's awful and ultimately not worth it. Players must show a specific event NPC within any server the items they have on hand. They have to be in your inventory or your storage area in order to be marked off. This even includes things like virus cores for some reason. This is grueling for a few reasons, but namely because your storage area and inventory aren't able to house that many unique items, meaning you have to discard items to make room for new ones. To further kick you while you're down, the events only reward you with an image for your desktop, I'm pretty sure, making it ultimately one of the worst events and rewards within the game's entirety. I cannot express how useless this event is unless you are trying to create a perfect 100% save file. The event alone will take you hours upon hours of grinding and backtracking anyway, it's, it's just not worth it. Alright, so some final thoughts. Dot Hack is an amazing, long-running series, one that many may consider dead by this point, but to me has managed to grasp onto life despite its irrelevance in the modern day gaming market. That's thanks to a lot of things, mostly due to such a dedicated fan base as well as the developers truly loving the series overall. CC2 is known to be big fans of their own work when it comes to Dot Hack. Unfortunately, Bandai Namco most likely doesn't see any financial incentive in keeping the series alive considering how niche the fan base is. Despite this, we did see GU at the very least get remastered and even come with additional content. Many ask for and often wonder if we will see the same kind of remaster for IMOQ. While I would be all for it, I do feel that anybody new to the series that would try it would ultimately have a bad time. As good as the aesthetic of Dot .hack is, the gameplay within IMOQ specifically is so archaic and abysmal by this point that it would be incredibly tough to swallow. That doesn't mean it's impossible however. Like how GU added some new features, IMOQ could potentially do the same in the form of quality of life. The multiplayer PS2 entry fragment was built off of the same engine and framework, while also adding in things like skill shortcuts so you didn't have to go into your menu every time you wanted to do an attack. Seeing something like that plus additional changes brought over into IMOQ could make it a much more enjoyable experience for a newer player base. I really enjoyed making this series, it's a passion project of mine born out of the love of Dot .hack and it's ever-evolving and expanding narrative. I've loved these games, anime, manga, and light novels for as long as I can remember, and I hope these videos give you a reason to try the games out for yourself if you have the means to. If you enjoyed this video and found it informative, consider supporting the channel by liking, commenting, and subscribing. Again, it only takes a couple of seconds and helps support me in my goal of creating this content for you all. I'll try to respond to every comment I can, so if you want to hear from me, be sure to let me know. Additionally, you can find me on Twitch, often playing through through Monster Hunter Challenge runs and discussing various topics. I hope to see you stop by. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video. Hey, thanks so much for watching and making it to the end of the video. You're in the Patreon section. This is where I shout out all the individuals that support me through Patreon. You have the credits over here for the high and G rank patrons and I'm going to shout out the G rank patrons now cuz they're so nice. They're so great. Josh Kobe, Triton 8, Festive, Snowcart, Prime XD, The Tim Pie, Ashtray, Disparity, Joy Sanders, Beyond the Time, Nolan Brookman, Carl the Crab, Moal Kasemi, Captain Zeba, Cyberworm, Kathleen Mejuk, Crunchy Kalru, Jonathan, Strange Lee, Rosalio, and Mr. Janky. Thank you guys so much for all the support over so many months, about a year maybe, maybe more. Really appreciate it guys, thank you so much, and I will see you in the next video.